Irish gentleman sitting next to me here, Jim Lovell, says if, if John Glenn can do it, he certainly can as well. Uh, we are uh, uh, told now that the space shuttle astronauts, the actual crew of Discovery, have all exited the Discovery orbiter. There is one astronaut on board, Jim Kelly, who is a kind of a, a mop-up man, if you will, Winston Scott. You want to tell us about that? Well, that's right. And we call them uh, astronaut support persons. And Jim is an astronaut, Jim uh, Vegas Kelly, as we call him. <laughs> Jim's on board now. He's taking over the communications and handling the other systems checks and power downs that need to be accomplished now so that the crew can get on about their, their business. Winston, do we still have prime crews and backup crews for our shuttle flights now, or do we not have that anymore? No, we don't have that anymore. Don't uh, train any backup crews for our shuttle flights now. We are starting to train some backup people for the expedition crews to the International Space Station. But all of the shuttle flights we've flown in the past several years, no backup crews. What happens if, say, the commander gets sick, like we had, uh, Ken Manley thought we were going to get the measles on Apollo 13? Well, fortunately, we haven't had that happen. But as you probably know, we send the crews into quarantine about eight days prior to flight. And the medical doctors feel that that's long enough that if anything is going to show up, it can show up and they can get rid of it prior to flight. They only eat the food that's cooked by the dietitians. They have intense medical screening, and so far it's worked pretty well. We're getting into an area here that I've been expecting for quite some time. I've been expecting Jim Lovell, this Gemini and Apollo veteran, to start lecturing you guys about how tough we had it in the old days. And, uh, you know, you, you young punks uh, and even John Glenn himself don't have to endure the, the uh, landing in a Pacific Ocean swelling over those uh, breakers and so forth. Uh, it's a pretty nice landing to be able to come down and, and just walk right out onto dry land, not, not, not heaving around in the Pacific. Huh? John, in the old days, there were iron men and wooden ships. <laughs> Today, we have, you know, you know, wooden men and iron ships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really, it really has changed a lot. It has. But I, listen, I, I'm envious with all the equipment they have on board and what they can do now with the shuttle. And now that the International Space Station is coming up, uh, it's incredible what NASA is doing. Juliet Huddy once again is joining us from alongside runway 33. Juliet, what's the latest there? Well, I hate to brag to you, but I mean, we really had probably one of the best views of the shuttle landing, perhaps besides the actual astronauts themselves. I think the best way to, just, to describe what happened here and actually what is happening right now, prior to the landing, it was like one big collective holding of the breath, and now everybody's sort of breathing that big massive sigh of relief people were very very interested in what was going on here obviously people riveted just staring with their mouths wide open there were so many things to worry about uh, first it was the weather the clouds coming in it seemed to dissipate as they hit land and that was a big relief but then of course it was those winds the cross winds would they exceed that 15 mile per or 15 knot uh, maximum and of course the shuttle crew decided to land here anyway there was, we were also concerned about the drag chute a lot of folks around here were talking about that drag shoot problem that we had uh, when the shuttle took off several uh, last week the, the uh, 11 pound panel that fell off as it went into orbit uh, the panel actually covers what is called the drag chute and that is usually deployed uh, during landing to stabilize the shuttle aircraft in crosswinds and of course with all these crosswinds and with the windy conditions there was concern that maybe they would need that and if they did need that they weren't going to be able to use it because when it did when the panel did fall off the straps covering that chute melted and it just would have been a real disaster if they had it to, if they needed to use that they definitely probably would have had to go over to the alternative landing site at edwards air force base in california but john as you said it was an absolutely picture perfect landing and uh, like i said a little earlier even us jaded media folk were sort of sitting here with our eyes wide open and i know juliet from talking to nasa that because of the interest in uh, john glenn's landing because of the interest in this mission they had a lot more people out there at the runway side today than they normally do. They normally might have a couple of hundred people today. I was told they were expecting a thousand, and that was actually something of a concern for NASA because just in case something went wrong uh, and there was some kind of a release of toxic vapors or something, they were concerned as to how they were going to evacuate all of you people who are right there beside the runway. We would have been running pretty fast, I got to tell you that. You know, it was actually kind of amusing now, but as the shuttle was sort of heading its way towards us, some of the folks who were standing here were saying, okay, back up, back up, like there was actually something that we could do if there was any problem. Thank goodness there wasn't. Uh, but, you know, there were about, I'd say, probably between 500 and 600 folks out here, a lot more media crew than normally covers shuttle landings, uh, and a lot of VIPs, of course. All right, Juliet, thanks very much. As we continue to keep an eye on the nose of shuttle discovery there, 
and also uh, on the crew transport system. Do I have the name right, Winston? Crew Scott? transport vehicle, crew the CTV. All right, and and what's it doing now? It looks like it's descending. Am, am it, I right? It sure is. You can, as you can see, it's backed away from the vehicle now. The crew's inside, and they've driven back something. It's also now being lowered back to its regular height, back to its normal height as a regular bus. Well, NASA says that uh, the walk around that you've been talking about is expected. So we are about to see the crew members emerge from that crew transport vehicle. This is, again, a largely ceremonial event? Yes, the walk around is ceremonial. ceremonial man, there's there's nothing technical that the crew has dumped. to do. But it's always nice to come out, to wave to your fans, to wave to your family, to talk to the technicians, the folks that really make this program go. It, it's just great to be able to spend a few minutes with them before proceeding uh, with your medical tests. The same kind of thing, Jim Lovell, that you liked to do during the Apollo and Gemini days. You didn't get much of a chance with those uh, capsules bobbing around in the ocean, though. Well, actually, we did when the, the capsule got on board the ship. Then we went back to the ship and sort of looked at it, pulled out some more stuff that we had, and just sort of patted it on the side. Trace Gallagher is also with us from the uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. And, uh, Trace, they have to be pretty happy there with the way this thing has they uh, are ended up. They are very elated, John. As a matter of fact, Juliet Huddy was just talking about the drag chute, and NASA had just told us they finally got a look at the drag chute door, the opening there. They said the drag chute looks fine to them. Now, we should note there were 83 experiments on board that conducted almost all of them uh, dealing with the effects of space and aging, but we will not get the results of those experiments for many months. Even NASA says up to a year. John Glenn still has a lot of work left to do. He's on the ground, but he'll be monitored for the next several weeks. He will continue to give more blood. More blood will be drawn from John over the next several weeks. They will continue to monitor his sleep patterns. So we will really not find out how John Glenn fared up in space and for several weeks. John Glenn also for the next uh, about a week and a half will not be allowed any alcohol or caffeine, which is kind of a troublesome issue for a man who really loves chocolate. This, by the way, Building 9, is also a tourist attraction. We've had some tourists coming through here, and people walk through, and they look up to us and say, hey, is he down? Is he down? And we say yes, and they say, oh, good, good, good. So they're all kind of wondering about John Glenn, how he's doing, and uh, it's good news to everyone that he fared very well in this, and very good news to NASA, because we talked to a lot of astronauts over the past week here in Houston, and there were some concerns. A lot of them would not go on the record and talk to us, but there were some underlying concerns about sending a 77-year-old man into space. And so, as um, Alicia said earlier, NASA really is collectively breathing a sigh of relief that everything went well, because if something had gone wrong, you're talking about uh, a lot of negative publicity, and then the critics really would have been hounding this mission. John? All right, Trace Gallagher there in Houston. Thanks very much. Uh, Winston Scott, I've got to ask you, what is that piece of equipment that we saw going up uh, to the shuttle? It's got a long hose on it. It, appear, it looks like a concrete pumping truck, but I'm sure NASA doesn't <laughs> use it for that. And again, that's one of the, uh, the ventilation, the uh, ground cooling units that's going to be connected to the shuttle to get some cooling air going through there. Cooling the equipment, cooling the people inside, and uh, cooling the, the structure of the vehicle itself. Now, we are waiting for our first view of the actual astronauts. We've been told to expect uh, the walk around of the shuttle to be coming at any moment. However, it appears at this time that they are still several feet in the air on that crew transport vehicle. It takes a while for that thing to get down to ground level, I guess, Winston. Not only that, but they're probably still taking off their suits. They're desuiting, getting out of those orange launching entry suits, putting oh, on their blue, uh, blue flight suits. And uh, the doctors are probably still giving them preliminary examinations. Uh, the crew is probably drinking ice water this time. They've uh, built up quite a heat load during the, the period between when the wheels stopped and they were able to get out. So they're just cooling themselves down, relaxing a little bit, getting their land legs back before they uh, come out for the walk around. What are, the, what are the medical checkups like? I mean, you've endured a couple of them. What are they going to do? Get poked and prodded a little bit? Yeah, some of them are routine, of course. They'll uh, ask you, first of all, they'll ask you how you feel. They'll see how well you stand, whether or not you can keep your balance. Uh, everybody typically has some blood draw. They'll take your heart rate, uh, monitor your, your heartbeat, your respiratory rate, and so on. Beyond that, the specific medical test depends on the individual and what they are participating in. For example, we know John Glenn is going to be participating in many, many more medical evaluations than the rest of the crew. So it sort of depends. 
Well, you know, Winston, we talked about the crew and what they're going to be doing here in the near future. What about this, the shuttle or the orbiter itself? What are, they, what are they going to do with that now that it's oh, sitting there? And that's an interesting story in and of itself. It'll sit there on the runway. The technicians will, will continue to safe it, to safe all of its systems. Then they'll eventually, a couple hours from now or so, hook a tractor up to it, and they'll actually tow it to our orbital processing facility, and it will begin its refurbishment process for its next launch. So it's an immediate recycle again. It's an immediate recycle, and that's the reason we like to land at Kennedy Space Center. We save the transportation cost of bringing it from Edwards in California, 3,000 miles to Kennedy, to begin that turnaround process. That was done in the early days when they wanted to have the, the wide expanse of that dry lake bed at Edwards to have absolutely all the runway that shuttle would possibly need. Exactly, and of course, as you know, the lake beds now provide us a backup landing capability if we can't land here in Florida. Is there a middle landing capability like at White Sands, New Mexico? Is that a possibility? White Sands is a possibility, and there's several other emergency landing sites that we could take either up the East Coast or, uh, or in other countries. But, but essentially, a normal deorbit, a normal entry and landing will either occur at Edwards or here at Kennedy. 